What I promised to talk about today, um, when we sent out the, the um, kind of initial uh, lunch and learn invite, was uh, website success for 2018. Uh, I did make some calls. I didn't have a chance to talk to everybody, unfortunately, but I, I made some calls and I, I just got a feel for what kind of your guys' pain points are and what things you are interested in hearing uh, about. So um, what I'm also gonna talk about is some of the finer points of kind of what in 2017 were the big myths that I kept hearing propagated and what we need to kind of kill once and for all and dispel as we move forward to 2018. Um, say what now? Oh, talk louder. But if you guys have specific questions on stuff, at the end we're gonna have a Q&A. So make sure that we, make sure you guys like raise your hand, ask questions so we can get to your specifics. Cool, sound good? All right, cool, so let's dive in. Okay, so how to get the most leads out of your website. That's gonna be our goal. So first, let's start with definitions because I don't wanna drive a bunch of terms and no one knows what's going on. So let's quickly go through the room here. Um, does everybody know what a backlink is? Okay, raise your hand if you don't know any of these words I'm saying. Backlink, organic versus ads, SEM, SEO. Don't feel, don't feel bad if you don't know, it's okay. We're all, this is a safe area. What is it called, safe zone? This is a safe zone, right? We have that with our kids, right? Where they can tell you something and they don't get punished. PPC, CAC, okay, that's customer acquisition cost, right? So it's the, it's the ultimate cost it takes to fully acquire a customer all the marketing channels added in. That's what CAC is. Domain authority, domain rating, everyone good on that? Backlink terms, tools to under help understand how authoritative something is. And ROAS. Okay, who, anyone wanna, if you don't, don't know what it is, wanna guess what ROAS is, just for fun? Funsies? Place, of, place in Middle Earth? From Lord of the Rings? Yes, Darren. Return on advertising spend? Yeah, return on ad spend. Here we go. Advertising, that's good, yeah, bro. okay, so return on advertising spend, good. So we're gonna, we're gonna use some of these terms, I just wanna make sure that everyone's really clear on what they are. If you don't know, um, feel free to raise your hand. Yes? Uh, Pay-per-click, <coughs> pay-per-click. PPC can be used interchangeably with SEM, which stands for Search Engine Marketing. So a really difference with SEO and SEM, we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, but SEO is when you Google something, you skip all the ads and you click on the ones that aren't ads, that's SEO. PPC and SEM are when you Google something and you click on all the paid stuff. The stuff at the very top and on all the ads on the side, which are PLA ads or those, the images when you search Keurig coffee maker, there's like nine million ads for Keurigs to buy on eBay and all those places. That's what PLA, and that's part of SEM or search engine marketing, it's paid. Cool, everybody good so far? Good, so I have this picture here. Uh, the, anyone, anyone uh, you get a free cookie if you know who this is. Anybody know who that picture is? Nobody? You know who it is? Who is it? That's Larry Page. Oh, but well you're close, you're close. Okay, so that's, that's one of the two founders of Google. So I always put this slide on here because there's always the guy who shows up who's like, Tim, I've, I've got all this. Like, I know, I know all these things. And I'm like, oh, like, are you Larry Page? He's like, who's Larry Page? It's like the founder of Google, right? So we always, we always put that just for funsies. But um, I'm assuming for today, for most of you guys, um, like if, if on a digital marketing kind of zero to 10, would most of you say you fall kind of in like a five to six range? Like pretty knowledgeable, but it's not like what you focus on every day. Um, I just wanna get a, get a feel for the room because I wanna make sure to, to cover things in a way that's gonna make the most sense. You guys, most of you guys are in the five, six range or some of you like 10, like you, you guys are Neil Patel crushing it, like just, just like epic at online marketing. That's you, Mark, right? No, five, yeah. Six. But okay, five six. So, so I'm. I want to kind of tailor this at a five six level to make sure that everyone can understand what's going on. And if you guys have like really deeper questions, like, hey Tim, this is too too beginner for me. Uh, grab me afterwards. We can go deeper and talk at a deeper level. Um, but I want to. I want to keep it at that kind of five six level today. Is that does that sound cool for everybody? Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, first uh, we want to dispel some myths. Okay. So the first myth, has anyone heard this, uh, read blogs, read Taboola articles that titled SEO is dead, don't waste your time anymore, do social media, right? Anybody? I'm seeing some smiles and some nodding, right? Um, SEO is not dead. It's kind of far from it. So I want to give you guys some proof on that. And, and it's not just because we're an SEO company. Uh, we actually believe this is true. Uh, SEO is not dead. Uh, here's some stats. So 
93% of all online experiences begin with a search engine. So even if people are going just to research something, they're not necessarily going to buy from your pay-per-click ad, they still start, in, start on a search engine, right? And SEO is that process of being found on a search engine. So doing social is great, doing email is great, trade shows, those things are all fine, but, but SEO at a core level is not dead, nor is it going to be for a long time until the search engines die. Right, so until you no know, people stop using Google and, and Google stops listing companies and products, SEO is not going anywhere. So it's going to be around for a long time. Also, 75% of, of users never scroll to page two. So you guys have heard the old SEO joke, where's the best place to hide a dead body? Page two of Google, right? Because no one will find it? Yeah, right. So, um, yeah. So this is the, the age old thing of, you know, we will we'll be talking to companies and they're like, oh, you know, we, we're working with a firm, everything's really good, you know, they've, they've kind of moved us forward and we Google and we're like, you're like on page four, they're like, but we were on page 80. We're like, that doesn't matter because <laughs> no one goes to page four. So with SEO, it, it really is this battle of, of the top three to four spots, right? Like the top three to four spots basically have all the traffic when it comes to organic. So everything below spot five, six, and seven, just you're there, but you're not getting much traffic. So you really do have to be at the top. Um, and then 70% of all users ignore paid ads and go right to search results, especially millennials. So the younger people are, the more they, they can quickly sniff out ads, and so they skip the ads because they know they're paid. There's this weird thing with SEO where, where people believe the non-paid organic is just more pure than the ad, right? Where it's like, well, that was paid, I don't trust it, but I trust this organic link that some guy spent millions to optimize so that I would rank here. Yeah, right, but people just trust it more. So because of that, there's this interesting thing with this trust on organic. When people come to your website via organic, they just believe the content is more authoritative and more pure. It's really interesting, but let's use that to our advantage as marketers, right? So I also want to show you guys one interesting thing here really quickly. I want to show it to you in this, this format so I can, whoops, not that. Here we go. How do we zoom in? How do we zoom? Not, I don't want to go to our invite. How do we zoom on this sucker? Oh, oh there we go. All right. So here's a couple of SEO stats uh, said you can't ignore. I think this is interesting. So 30% of, of link clicks are non-organic, which means 70% of link clicks go to organic listings. We've covered that. 61%, the cost of inbound leads is 61% cheaper than outbound leads. So most of your guys' companies probably do sales today, right? You guys have sales channels, sales teams, inside sales, outside sales, um, sales support. We do as well. But studies have shown inbound is 61% cheaper. And the reason why is you don't have to pay out outbound sales commissions, right? The leads that come to you are very warm. They're already interested. A lot of time in outbound sales is wasted because you're calling on companies who aren't interested, right? So not only is SEO not dead, but SEO long term can be cheaper than outbound sales, right? So something to mull over. It's just an interesting stat to think about. And then 81% of businesses consider their blogs to be an important asset to overall business. That's kind of a cool stat. These, I think, are super interesting. SEO leads have a 15% close rate, while outbound leads have a 2%. That's interesting, right? But it makes sense. Think about it. If you guys are, have any of you guys ever been in sales for, <coughs> excuse me, for either your org or another org? Majority of businesses you call on, what do they say? No. No, thanks. Not interested. We're good. I have another provider. It's the sun's in my eyes. It's a bad time of the month. I don't want to talk to you right now. Go away. It, whatever the answer is. I don't want to buy from you, right? That's what most people say. When SEO, they come to you and they're like, yeah, I really want to buy XYZ service. I just want to price checking, but they're curious and they're interested to buy from you, right? Does that make sense? So one of the benefits of inbound marketing just in general, if it's not a big part of your guys' strategy, is the leads are actually, they close at a much higher percentage and they're much cheaper to acquire. So kind of something cool to consider. Um, obviously, you guys know 79% of search engine users uh, click on search results. 93% of online experiences start with a search engine, right? And 82% of internet users use search. So I, I don't think SEO is dead and I don't think it's gonna die anytime soon. It's not going anywhere. So anyway, myth dispelled, right? You guys agree? Myth dispelled, okay, good. It's myth, what, myth busters, right? What are they, yeah, myth busters. What'd they say? Like, busted, yeah. Myth, oh, that would've been, that would've been good. We should have myth busted. Dang it, I always come up with the best ideas in the talk. All right, so number two, have you guys ever heard this one? Content is king, right? Content is king. All right, so, so just as a uh, jumping ahead here, but this is a fun point of, fun of, I like audience participation. 
How many of you guys have, for the last year, two years, or three years, done like consistent blogging for your website for the purpose of increasing your SEO and your, and your leads and your sales? Anybody? Okay. How's that worked out for you in reality? Did it have the desired effects? You, so you guys said it did. You guys, you got other guys think so? Did some? Did the blogging specifically raise your rankings and sales for your difficult keywords you're going after? No. And it can't. So when people sell this whole content as king, what they're trying to say is the content's really important, but I want to kind of dispel this myth because we hear this all the time where people say, just, just write good content and, and the rest will happen, right? That's like the Silicon Valley myth, like just build beautiful software and people will like call, they will beat down a path to your door to buy from you, you will be so rich, investors will swarm you, they'll shake you out of your bed in the middle of the night to give you money, right? It doesn't actually happen in reality. So what happens in digital marketing, content's important but it's not the most important thing when it comes to SEO and actual traffic and conversions, okay? So we actually make the argument that content is queen and backlinks are king. So where something rakes on the page is going to have a huge impact to the traffic it generates. And if you have average content that gets twice the traffic of your competitors, do you think you're going to convert more customers or less? Much more. Because you just have way more traffic, right? If you have a store that doesn't have the best design but you get 10 times the traffic, you'll probably sell more donuts than the next guy. Organic works the same way. So your traffic shouldn't be terrible, but it's not going to be the driver of, of, of actual SEO the way most people think it is. What actually works really, really well is backlinks to, those, to that content, which will drive it up in the rankings, which then gets way more traffic, and then you can actually test and optimize from there. Okay? So the idea of content as king is just, at a core level, pretty wrong. Okay? Backlinks are king, at least when it comes to SEO. So have you... I guess this is other myth I'm going to bust. This is a blogging strategy for SEO specifically. The reason people do this is because they want, people always hear like, oh, it's really good for SEO to have a lot of content on your website, right? So kind of back to Cornell's example, people are blogging about the most random things like Mondays, National Peanut Butter Association Day, like all these kind of things that are like not helpful. And it doesn't actually improve the relevance of your site for any of the topics you're going for. So it doesn't really do anything. So if, if you guys are just blogging for SEO in general, I would recommend a different approach. That's not going to help you very much. It's much better to write fewer articles and then build links to those pages, and then those are going to rank much more effectively than just creating a lot of content all over the place that's really unfocused. Because blogs without links won't rank. That's just kind of the way it goes. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so the, when I say the truth is more complicated, how something actually ranks and gets traffic in, in, in the search engines is a mixture of three things. Relevance, backlinks, and ranking factors. So we'll take a quick look at that. So I want to show a keyword here that everyone always knows is really competitive, right? We all know how competitive personal injury attorney t terms always are. They're always really expensive. They're like 50, 60 bucks a click and or AdWords. So this is like one of the most competitive terms out there. This is Ahrefs, if any of you guys are familiar with it. So the keyword difficulty of 34 is like really high, like really hard in Ahrefs. This is one of the most competitive ones there is. So this gets 16,000 searches a month. This is national, by the way. I just use the United States. Um, and so if you rank to the top for this, you get almost 5,000 hits a month from this individual keyword. So here is a breakdown of the top 10 searches in Google nationally for this term, right? Personal injury attorney. So let's take a look at this. So I actually want to, I'm going to walk over here and we'll talk. Okay, so um, this is where it's going to get interesting and confusing. So if it was just about content, like the website having the most content would make it rank or the best content, if you guys notice, Wikipedia is number three. What website has more content and better content than Wikipedia? <coughs> Not very many. So why would Wikipedia rank number three for a term it's obviously relevant for, which is personal injury lawyer, why would it rank number three if it's literally the most one of the most authoritative sites in the world and has literally the most content? Anybody want to venture a guess? Specificity. Specificity, yep, or, or relevance, right? <coughs> Anyone else have any ideas? There's free cookies if you get an answer right. <laughs> so let me throw out an idea. 
So this one right here, you have find law and you have, and you have justia, right? Look at this one here, which is DR, which stands for domain rating. So domain rating is basically, uh, it's a combination of how many links point to that page. And you guys all know what a backlink is, right? It's a link on someone else's website that points to that website. So it's a way in Google of basically saying, this website's so good, I'm going to actually link to it on my website. It's an upvote. It's essentially upvoting in social media, right? Where I'm willing to put a link to this other website on my page, because it's so good. That's what a backlink is, right? And Google was built on backlinks. That was actually the, when they invented Google, that Larry and Sergey were Stanford PhD students. And they actually built this idea of, let's create a search engine based on backlinks, not keywords. And it made them billionaires. It was, it was a pretty good research project. But um, so DR, domain rating, is basically this measurement of how many links are pointing to your site and how powerful are those links, OK? So Wikipedia has an 88, which is real good. It's gooder than 73, right? So this is higher. This URL rating says, how, how good is that individual URL? It only has 430 backlinks. This has 2,821 pointing to this individual page, but yet it still ranks above it. So it's not just backlinks, it's also relevance. So what Google is looking at here is they're saying, well, find law is literally only about lawyers. That's all it's about, personal injury attorneys. Wikipedia is one of the best websites in the world, so we're going to put them up here because they're really good. But you're not totally about lawyers, and we know it, because you're also about a lot of other stuff, and we know that too. So we're going to put you here at three. But we, you should be on the page. Justia, you guys are you guys are a little bit lower. You've got a dom you're also just about lawyers, but your domain rating's a 70, so you're a little bit less relevant. You have 156 backlinks versus 430, so you're a little bit less authoritative but you're also more relevant than Wikipedia for this term, so we're going to put you number two. You guys see where we're going with this? And then on, and it goes down here. So I put these guys on here, Salino and Barnes. These guys are in New York City only. How did they get on this list? They're like n ranking nationally. Look at this thing right here. It's AR, which is basically a ranking of how quickly they're building links, how, how well they're building links to their website. It's a 1.6 million. They're like crushing all these other ones, like way more. And the reason they got on here is because while their DR and, and UR are not nearly as good, or in their amount of links, they're building links at such a fast rate for this term that Google's like, these guys must be doing something. They must have a really relevant and authoritative website. We should probably put them up here. That's why they're, that's why they're going up. So what it really takes to rank for keywords in 2018 is not just content. So it's not just, oh, write this perfect content and then put it on your website and magically you'll rank and traffic and you'll, it'll convert. That's not going to work. It's also not, hey, just spam a ton of backlinks to all your stuff that you buy on Fiverr. Please, by the way, don't ever do that. That'll get you banned. But just put a bunch of backlinks to your website. That also doesn't work. It's a combination of all three. The ranking factors, so things like title tags, meta descriptions, headers, stuff you guys have heard before the standard on-page white hat stuff, how many links you get, and how relevant your site is for those terms. You got to balance all three of those. So going into 2018, that's what Google is really focused on, is not being able to just focus on one piece and do it well. You've got to really focus on making your site as relevant for the term you want to go for as possible, building great links that are also relevant for that term, and writing content that is helpful to your users and relevant for that term. Make sense? OK, good. We'll keep going. <clears throat> All right, so I promised we'd talk about kind of lead maximization and how to, how to maximize leads. Um, so let's do that now. So I, I created a couple slides here that, and by the way, you guys don't have to write all this down. Just send me uh, in your little folders, guys, when you open them, my business card's in there. If you want the PowerPoint presentation, just email me. I'll send you the whole thing. So I'll be happily, happily share you the PowerPoint with you. So you don't have to write all this down. So you don't have to focus on that. But let me go through some of this. These are, these are kind of our standard recommendations for, for clients going into 2018, the ways to maximize the leads coming out of your site. Okay, So here's, here's kind of step one. Focus on the customer's buying journey. It's really important you back up to that level before you start on your digital marketing because marketing is all about connecting one-on-one -on -one with humans and solving a pain and a need. And if you don't know the human you're really going after, it's hard to market to them effectively. Make sense? So the buying journey is really important. So here's a couple questions for everybody, like introspective questions. Do you really know your ideal client persona? 
right? Now, if you know them, do you have, have you put it on paper? Have you made your three ideal clients? Do they have a face? Do they have a name? Do they have a, a, an age, a gender, a, a demographic details, where they live, where they're from? <laughs> have you really mapped it out so your, your salespeople and your marketers can really identify with this person, right? So is, you know, Susie XYZ, she's 46, she lives in Westchester, she has a minivan and three dogs, she has one kid but she likes her dogs more, and she loves shopping at PetSmart and XYZ, whatever, right? You have this whole thing mapped out, so then we know who we're marketing to. So as you're making decisions in terms of your digital marketing, you're thinking everything about Susie, right? And then we think about, well, Susie really likes to shop on her iPad, so we really need to make sure our, our site is, is mobile friendly because she doesn't shop on her desktop, she shops on her, desk, or, or her iPad, right? Does this make sense, like why you should start there? This gets people really confused because they look at it and they're like, well, our traffic's from desktop and well, we think it's mostly manufacturers searching for us. Like, well, let's get a little deeper than that, right? And then, so do you have the first map them out? Uh, and that's a really fun thing to do, by the way, because you can name them whatever you want. You can pick whatever pictures you want. You can have fun with that. Like, it can be, it can be fun. Do you know with certainty how your actual ideal client uses the web, right? So if you're selling to the decision maker of a manufacturing facility, are they the one even doing the Googling? Or do they have their assistant doing the Googling? Do they even know how to Google? That sometimes is a problem, right? How do they use the web? Because the decision maker you're trying to sell to how they use the web might be different than how you think they use the web. And that could cause challenges with conversion, right? Um, this is a really important thing to focus on, a research journey versus a purchasing journey. So the difference is, let's say that you guys are gonna buy Christmas gifts, right? Which I still have to buy mine. I have not done any of that yet, because um, I am a, I do things early. I'm not a procrastinator, but I'm gonna do my gifts. Let's say that I'm gonna buy my wife a Christmas gift, right? I'm not just gonna like Google and instantly go to the first website and buy something. It's not gonna happen. There's a, there's a researching journey, right? The keywords you search to research something are different than the keywords you search to buy something, right? So like, let's say that I'm gonna research a new car. I'm not going to type in an exact car brand. I'm gonna type in, you know, best luxury car 2018 or something. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some blogs and articles. I'm gonna look at some pictures, see what I think is really pretty, what will be really nice. Oh, red is really good, okay. And then I'm gonna start looking at brands and then my final purchase, if I'm like, I'm gonna get a Tesla. My final keyword is probably, you know, 2018 Tesla Model X lease amount. That's a buying keyword. Do you guys see the difference though? Those, those keywords can be very different and do you wanna optimize your site differently and your marketing differently based on those keywords, okay? Okay, does it make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, so it's audience guinea pig time. And that was the fun part. So um, anybody in here wanna be a guinea pig? We'll, we'll specifically, well, I wanna pick on a couple keywords and have some fun with this. I want to look at the difference between your guys' research journey and purchasing journey. We'll just do some quick Google search. So anybody, anybody want to volunteer? Not to be picked on. Yes. Okay. Let's 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 do this. All right. So, what what's your industry? What do you what do you sell? What do you guys do? I'm a uh, self-employed uh, marketing consultant uh, in the arts. Okay. Arts. Marketing consultant for the arts. So. If someone was going, if they're not sure they would need a marketing consultant, right? What would they, what would they start looking for? Like, would they search marketing consultant? Yeah. Well, they might. Well, depends on how knowledgeable they are. Uh, That's definitely true. <laughs> maybe, well, marketing consultant for a art museum. Okay. So let's, um, let's first do this. So let's just do something broad. Marketing consultant, if I could type and spell here. Consultants. It's hard to type while staring down. All right, so if we look at marketing consultants, what's gonna come up is a bunch of companies wanting to sell marketing services and all that, right? So this is going, someone's gonna search here and say, okay, here's all these, here's all these groups, okay. Here's all these different websites. They're all selling me the same thing. Is this really what I'm looking for? Okay, this is part of their journey. They're like, no, I, I really want to say, you said for a museum, for an art museum? Yeah. Then they come back, like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. So then they say, for art museum. Museum. Okay. Oh, did I misspell it? Oh, E-U-M. So they come back and say, okay, now we want this one. 
Well, KPMG, no, probably not that. IBM, definitely not that. Oh, here's Art Zealous. So now they come and they look for these, they start to come to some of these websites. They go there, they learn, and then they figure out, oh, the term I really want is like expert art museum marketing, you know, whatever. And their search term gets longer and more specific, fewer searches and more competitive. And then you find out that's the journey. Does that make sense? So let's, we'll take this exact one here. It sure would be nice if you had pages on your site that were optimized for each of these different journeys in the process so that along the way you could get them to your site every time. So when they Google just marketing consultant, oh, they found your website and then it said, hey, what kind of marketing consultant are you looking for? If you need SEO consultant, go here. If you need PPC, go here. If you need art museum, go here, <laughs> right? That's us. And then as, you, as they get more and more specific, do you guys get where I'm going with this? So you can help guide the person online through their journey as opposed to just letting fate happen and let them find your competitors, okay? So this is part of that, that research versus buying journey, trying to get them along the path. Okay, so for sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving, but um, if you guys have other questions on that, we can talk later. But it's really important to break down the researching versus buying journey. Because that, the research is where you build the trust and the relationship. The buying is where you actually make the sale, but the better you can do at building the, the relationship on the front end, the, be, the, the easier the sale is. Okay, the second thing I would really recommend you guys focus on is, is CRO, or conversion rate optimization. So the basic idea of CRO is trying to remove any friction to conversion, okay? So when they come to your website, is it super easy for them to know where to find your contact info? Is your website at the very top, or is your, is your phone number at the very top, in, in bold, easily clickable, right? Is your contact form easily reachable? Contact page is easy to find at the top of your site, on the bottom of your site, follows them everywhere. One of the biggest challenges, contact forms, you guys probably know this, three blanks is the optimal size. Every blank above three spots on a contact form decreases conversion by 50%, right? So that's bad. So, Every blank, so on a contact form, right? So it says, contact us, name, email, phone, zip code, country, city of ethnicity, blood type, and all those things you have to fill out, they're all required. Every blank after three decreases conversion by 50%. So the salespeople want all the details, but people don't want to give you all their details, right? So try to keep it a little more broad if you can, you'll, you'll get more conversions. If you just do name, email, and zip code or name, email, company, or something like that, the, their email is probably gonna have their company name on it anyway, right? And so I know your sales people are like, no, I want all the information. But you'll increase conversions, you'll end up having more leads because oftentimes if there's seven required blanks, people are like, ah, screw it. And they just don't fill it out, okay? And you should be testing this. Okay, for time, we gotta keep going. Uh, create content that truly adds value to your ideal client. This is an important one. When you're writing content for 2018, we really recommend give your client what they would pay you for, but give it to them for free. We believe in this, right? So we could charge for this lunch and learn, but we don't because we don't want to. We want to give it away for free because we want to help people. If you do the same thing, the, the world of freemium is taking over, especially in 2018. Companies that give things away for free that have value will build trust and loyalty and you guys can do the same thing with your clients and with your prospects by giving them information that they would pay for for free. That's the best content out on the web. Is the content you're like, I can't believe this is free. Like, this is incredible. That will build trust, okay? Um, once you've done those three things, your persona, you've optimized your site for conversion, you've gotten all the stuff out of the way that makes it hard to convert on your site, now you're ready to promote and market. So when you're doing SEO, um, instead of just doing the kind of all over the place blogging, build landing pages that are keyword specific. So whatever your keyword is, you know, industrial parts manufacturer, build those landing pages and then build links to those specific pages. That's gonna drive those pages up in search rankings. It's also gonna make them perform better in AdWords because of quality scores, that's another story. Link building is time consuming, but the ROI is extremely high. Because once your page ranks on spot one and you're getting 50% of the search traffic every month for no extra cost, the, the ROI is extremely high. Like it pays itself back really fast. So we really recommend it. Link building is expensive, it's time consuming, but it's really worth the cost. Okay, AdWords. Make sure in 2016, 2018, <laughs> what year are we in? 2018. 
use ads differently than you use SEO. <clears throat> they are different, okay? So the analogy that we use with, with ads, uh, kind of here in, on seven, it's, it's the same between buying a house and renting an apartment. SEO is like buying the house. It's slower, it's expensive, you put the down payment, you live in it for a long time. Ads, you turn on, you turn off, it's like an apartment, okay? But they don't build any long-term value. Once you stop paying for AdWords, they're off. You turn them back on again, you have them, you turn them off, they're gone. SEO is long-term value, like buying a house. It's also slower, and it's a, it's a bigger investment long-term. So you wanna use them differently, and with AdWords, you wanna, you wanna put aside money to test and experiment, because with AdWords, you can buy your most expensive keyword tomorrow, and if it's not converting, turn it off. With SEO, you can't do that. You gotta do all the work to get to spot one and see if it's converting, and then you're like, oh, geez, we invested 50 grand, and no one wants to buy anything from this keyword. Don't do that with SEO, do that with AdWords because then you can spend $1,000 and figure out that same thing, right? So use, for 2018, use AdWords to be your testing platform to try new keywords and try, con try conversion, and also make sure your, your pages are converting really well. Use AdWords for that. It's really good for that. Okay, and last is lead nurture. Um, make sure to expand out. Once you get leads to your website, don't just let them die there. Follow up with them. Email campaigns, trade shows, direct mail go to the trade shows and, and be like, oh, you, you, you guys were a lead for him. I want to get a chance to meet you at our next trade show. Send him a direct mail piece. Try a bunch of the standard marketing stuff once people convert on your, on your website as a, as a way to open a door to build a relationship. Okay, thou shalt track. So Peter Drucker said, you can't measure, you can't manage what you can't measure. So my biggest recommendation to you guys for 2018 is everything that you can track possibly you should be. Um, here's the exact tools we use, I'll tell you guys. So this is exactly what we recommend and what we use internally. Uh, CallRail, so CallRail is super cheap. It's like 30 bucks a month. And you can track every single phone call that comes to your website from every source. So you can see how many people called you from organic, how many people called from AdWords, how many people called from social, how many people called from direct. And that way you can actually find out how many conversions are going through your phone channel so you're not missing those conversions. Google Analytics, if set up properly, can track everything else. <laughs> Traffic channels, lead forms, um, mobile visitors, conversion percentages, all your different mediums. So between these two softwares, you can, Google Analytics is free, the free version's free, which is and it's all you'll need. And CallRail is 30 bucks a month, so between these two, these two forms, you literally, other than rank tracking, which you need SEMrush for, you literally can track everything. So, and they're super easy to set up, okay? So this is what a monthly report should look like. So this is actually a monthly report for one of our clients. So not a sales pitch, but that was a pretty good in in increase in uh, goal completions there, eh? But uh, anyway, um, but no sales pitch, just, you know, it's just really nice, 217% increase. That's, <laughs> I wonder who does their SEO. Anyway, um, so on the all goals section here, we set this up so all the call rail data is automatically synced, right? So every time they get a phone call, it's tracked as a goal, conversion. Every time they get a, a form fill, it's tracked as a conversion, and then we track every single one of those. It's automatically put in this form. So in every month, you just have to pull one report in analytics, and you get to see every single conversion, every phone call, every lead form, every conversion for the whole site in one place, super easy, broken down by every channel. Organic, CPC, Facebook, LinkedIn. So analytics is an incredible tool, and it's free. So there's no reason not to use it. Okay, last thing. Here's some tools that we use that I'm recommending if you guys just, you know, we're, we're not like resellers. Well, I guess we're resellers for SEM Rush, but, you know, we don't have any special discounts or anything. These are tools that we use internally, so I thought you guys might like to see this. AdWords, huge. CallRail, great. Longtail Pro is really good for keyword research. Ahrefs is really good for link building and any type of link research for SEO. Google Analytics and then SEM Rush is really good for competitive research. So if you want to dig under the hood and find out what your, your competitors are doing, like everything on their website, SEM Rush is awesome for that. It's like literally reading their mail, but it's legal. It's pretty sweet. Okay, so um, Q&A time. So we got a couple minutes left. Thanks, I, I know we, we started a couple minutes late. So um, I want to open it up for some Q&A for either for me or Cornell or anything. So who's got questions? Yes. I do. This may be for after. Okay. But can you speak at all to uh, business in China? Good question. So, do you mean using Baidu versus Google? Correct. Just, just the whole concept of SEO in China and language differences and all that good stuff. That's a. So the the question was um, SEO in China. 
So I'll be honest, I don't know much about that. I'll be straight up. Google doesn't operate in China anymore. They pulled out. So now there's Baidu, which is Yandex is the big one in Russia, and Baidu is the big one in China. I'm not a Baidu expert, and I don't speak Chinese or Mandarin. So I, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, so I, I'm going to have to respectfully say I don't know. But I think Mark knows. Okay. They're, they're global, so he probably knows better than I do. Yeah. Great question. Who else has questions? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know anything about SEO in China. Yes? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, once you identify your buyer persona? Yes. How do you guide them through the research journey versus the purchasing journey? Uh, is that true for that that you specifically geared towards those respective places? Great question. So, and what was your name? Sanya. Sanya. Great question. So the, the question was, can, can I talk a little more about the, the, the uh, purchasing journey, like the, the research and purchasing journey? How do you guide them through that? Um, so the answer is with your content. So when you think about your ideal persona, um, what do you guys sell? What's your, what's your service or product? We're actually a marketing process outsourcing company. OK. So content marketing and digital marketing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's uh, a couple of our offerings. I do the content marketing part of it. OK. Uh, but I'm interested in learning more about how that meshes with uh, SEO and digital marketing. Yeah, good question. So, so let's, say, let, let's say you guys sell content marketing. We'll just make it simple, right? So what I would recommend for you specifically is figure out who buys the content marketing, right? Is it the, is it the agency owner? Is it the internal in-house marketing manager? Is it, the content, is it the marketing coordinator? Who's the, gonna be the ultimate internal champion who brings you in, right? And then what is their journey? What's the first keyword they search for? Try to figure that one out. And usually people search the shorter keyword first, the more broad one or two word phrases because they don't know. And then as they start to realize, they get longer, more detailed searches. So I guess my easy answer is, like, let's say yours is like content marketing is like the first one people start with. Maybe you can't win for that one because it's too competitive, but you could buy ads for that. You could buy the top ad for like content marketing and then say like, looking to buy content marketing, come here. And then they come to your page and your page can be an explanation of, do you have problem A, B, and C? If so, here's how we can help you. If you have problem D, D E, and F, we're not your team, but you need this. So if you give them a lot of value, like if they were to talk to a sales rep, but just give it to them for free, that could be really helpful. Or if you had like an infographic that would explain to them like their process of how they should look to bring in content marketing, why they should do it. Some, like, something that would be really educational in nature could really help. Because you probably know your brand has to touch someone seven times before they buy from you. They have, like, the subconscious has to see your brand seven times before their brain actually thinks it's something they should invest in, right? It's just these subconscious things in marketing. So even if they go to your site, they see your infographic, and they see your logo, and they're like, okay, and they leave, the next time they come that they see something of yours, their brain's naturally gonna be like, oh, I've seen this before, I trust it to some degree, even though it's completely subconscious. Does that make sense? So you're being involved in that journey. The best way to, to maximize the journey is if you know all the keywords along the process and you can own all of those via ads or organic, and every time they search that keyword, they come to your site and you're educating them down your process, that's the best. That's the way to really crush it. Yes? I have a follow-up question about the research journey. Yes. So, for example, one of my personas is uh, candidates for software developer jobs. Oh, okay. And the best, like, recruitment and the best Correct. And how, like, they don't have a research process if they're not actively looking for a job. Great question. That's a good question because, so they're not a typical, like, SEO because they're not searching. Right. And, SEO is, and SEO is all about people who are searching. So that passive candidates are different because you're, you're spear phishing them, right? You're running out and you're trying to find them and stab them and bring them back to the cave. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's right. They don't come to the cave on their own, right? You got to go find them. So that's a little bit, that's a good question. Um, here's what you could do is if you find something they're interested in, like let's say they're going to GitHub to look at like, you know, new AI coding trends, you could write articles about that and then say, are you interested in working on the latest tech? Come check out what we're doing. Does that make sense? So you could, you could write things that they're gonna read on their own that they're interested in, like a Taboola article kind of thing, and then have your pitch at the bottom. Now they might ignore it because they're like, oh, I'm not looking but you could get your logo in front of them. 
right? Like they go back to that same thing of they're like, oh, you know, who do you work for? Calibrity. Calibrity. So they're like, oh, I've seen Calibrity. Uh, that's interesting. And then when your when your recruiter reaches out and says like, oh, hey, we have this ex awesome job for you at Dunhumby, they're like, oh, I've heard of Calibrity. Does that make sense? That's probably the best you can do if they're not actively searching because then they're not really looking for something using the web. That's a great question. Does that answer your question though? Cool. Okay, one last question, and then I, I want to make sure we're good on time. Anyone have that last burning desire or need it? Yes, Darren. That's all I'm trying to um, leveraging video and optimizing video for, uh, for SEO. Great question. So, um, as you guys know, video is declining massively. No one uses video <laughs> in the future. Uh, oh, sorry, Darren. I, I've offended. Yeah. Throw it out. Yeah. So, uh, smartphones, uh, this is not known yet, but I talked to Steve Jobs a couple weeks ago, and he said they're going to get rid of cameras on smartphones. No one uses them anymore. So, obviously, I'm being facetious. Um, video is going to continue to explode. I think um, one of the major like polling companies said that, that they think 90% of the, the data in the world on the, on the online in like 2020 is going to be video. Like literally video data is going to eat the entire world. So all of like companies are going to become huge data centers for video as everyone's streaming literally everything. So video is going to be super important for SEO down the road. Um, we didn't talk about video optimization here in detail, but if you guys are not doing video, you need to be. Video is critical. And where video is really important is for building relationships with people where they can't build a relationship with your content the way they can with your video. So building video is really important for that. Optimizing video, so YouTube, does anyone know YouTube is the second largest search engine next to Google? It's also owned by Google. So when you optimize YouTube videos, they rank really well on Google <laughs> because Google owns them, so they prioritize their own stuff. Here's a cool tip for you guys, you may not know this. If you build a, a video, so this could go back to your recruiting, recruiting question. If you build a YouTube video and optimize it for whatever term you want, you can literally build links to that video as fast as you want. Google will never penalize it, ever, because it's their own site, and it will rank extremely quickly. So that's just a little hint for you guys if you ever want to rank for any term ultra fast, use a, use a YouTube video. So you can even use that to rank for any competitive term, right? You want to rank for a personal injury attorney, you know, have your corporate video, optimize, uh, go into the uh, YouTube, optimize it for personal injury attorney, build links to that page, it'll rank in the top three spots in, in several months. It'll rank very quickly because YouTube has such good SEO factors as a core structure. So YouTube is really important. And anytime you build videos, put them on YouTube so you can market them. And then you can and do the same thing on the YouTube video you would on your uh, organic page. Titles, meta descriptions, fill out the content, put your keyword in there, and build links to those pages. Do the exact same thing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes? Does embedding the YouTube video within your page have any impact on SEO if you're SEOing the video on YouTube? And Good question. So there's this little trick when, you, when Google indexes videos significantly faster than the index wow. text. So when you embed a, a YouTube video, it's a, Google will re-index your, Paul, what is it? They'll re-index your page. Like when you, when you put a YouTube video in a page, how fast do they re-index it? It could be like an hour or so, but it's fast. If you have a site map, that you, a video site map, yeah, I mean, they get like an hour. Yeah, so you guys probably know, like, like let's say you build a, a new a page on your website, Google's index can sometimes take weeks to pick up that new page and like, e like it can take months to rank it. A, a, a trick you can use is Google indexes videos extremely quickly. I don't know why, but they do. So if you put a video on a page and then republish that page, go back to Search Console and submit the sitemap, that page can be ranking within like a couple days. It'll, it'll literally get re-indexed in like an hour just because it has a YouTube video in it. I don't know why they do that, but they do. So that can help SEO factors and get, it can get the page ranking a lot quicker. And Google also likes pages with video. Like they're, that's becoming ranking factors down the road. They're looking at pages with video. Plus, when people stay on your page and they watch your video, it increases um, duration times, which people look at as well. So bounce rate goes down, average duration goes up, and then people can click through to your YouTube channel. So in pretty much every way, it helps your, helps your SEO. So I would recommend you embed the video on the page as well as optimize the YouTube channel and the page, which is a lot of work, I know. And, and you can you know, probably you can outsource some of that if you don't want to do all of it. There are like video optimization teams and stuff. But that would be the best option. Plus, people can search the YouTube for the video as well, and it'll get a bunch of views. Great questions. Well, I'm officially going to wrap this up because I know some people have to leave. I'll be, we'll stick around. Our team will be around for, for the next you know, 30, 40 minutes. 
If you guys have questions, thank you so much for attending. Was, was this helpful? Did everyone have a good time? Okay, great.